Perhaps the most famous volcanic eruption in history was that of Krakatau on August 26 and 27 of 1883. Known to the western world as Krakatoa, it lies between Java and Sumatra, the most volcanically unstable pair of islands ever known. The eruption of Krakatau was a Plinian, phytomagnetic eruption, in which seawater mixed with magma creating superheated steam. The numbers regarding its destruction are staggering. The fifth most powerful eruption in the discernible record. During the eruption, 13% of the Earth's surface vibrated audibly. The eruption hurled materials 30 miles into the sky. In an instant, six cubic miles of rock were gone. For the next several years, global temperatures dropped an average of one degree. The eruption was heard clearly at Rodriguez Island, 2,968 miles away, sounding like the rumbling of cannon fire or the distant song of a blue whale. The air pressure waves passed around the Earth seven times at a speed of 675 miles an hour. This air wave, echoing around the globe, lasted 15 days. Then there was the tsunami. It's estimated that when the wave hit the Sumatran coast, it was 10 stories tall. The wave carried ships two miles inland. One ship's massive mooring buoy was found far inland at 50 feet above sea level. Railway tracks were twisted and scattered, and it picked up a 600-ton block of coral reef and obliterated a lighthouse with it. All in all, the event killed about 40,000 Indonesians. Here is the last map drawn of the volcano before it pushed self-destruct. All that was left of the original cone was a chunk of the crater wall and a small jetty of andesite columns. These vestiges were clean slates, a tabula rasa of life. Krakatoa became one of the first and best studied cases of island succession. Then, a few days after Christmas, in 1927, the volcano woke up. A new cone formed where the old one used to be, and it has been growing bigger and bigger ever since, by about 5 inches per week, every year getting 20 feet higher and 40 feet wider. It is called Anak Krakatau, Child of Krakatoa. This is what it looked like in 1978, and here it is smoldering in 2008, as I saw it. From my teaching site, I took an overnight train to Sumatra's southernmost town. Wandering the streets and steaming coastline, I found a man with an outrigger canoe willing to take me to the volcano. It was a five-hour, sputtering ride out to the Krakatoa ruins, but soon enough the haze lifted to reveal the child of Krakatoa, surprisingly close. As we neared, we could see that it was fuming. Apparently, only a week before, Anak Krakatoa had been erupting violently and steadily. It was now, relatively, in repose. We landed on its shores, and my guides declined to venture up its slopes, so I pressed on alone wading through ash among a thin forest that had managed to sprout along Anak's shores, and seeing the volcano's influence on their struggle. Pyroclastic bombs were scattered along the slope, some as big as small cars. Here's a small one, its impact crater, suggesting that it was jettisoned very recently after the last rain. It was not until after my trip I learned that visitors are routinely struck by these lava bombs, some fatally injured. I walked past drainages carved into the ash by the rains, and a decommissioned weather station that seemed precariously placed. From the summit of the crater, I could see the only remaining vestige of the original Krakatau. This fraction of crater wall is known as Rakata, and it would be our bedroom that night. Landing on its pristine shores, I saw that its lush forest had managed to return to its dense, multi-storied condition before the 1883 eruption. Most of the species that had recolonized the ruins had to reach it from Sumatra or Java, meaning that most of them had innovative seeds that were fantastic at dispersal. Here is our camp, which afforded a glorious and daunting view of Anak Krakatau. As we cooked fish over our fire, precocious five-foot swimming monitor lizards lurked in and around our camp, occasionally lunging for our meals. One tried to rip open my tent that night. I did not get much sleep. Luckily, we did not also encounter the 25-foot reticulated pythons known to infest Rakata. As we set out back the next morning, we rounded the more desolate side of Anak Krakatoa, where no trees had managed to overcome the circumstances. But as we pointed home, my last glimpse of the volcano was a memorable one, a lone tree giving all it had to survive. Life finds a way. 
For all the horrific loss of human life caused by Krakatoa, there have been some long-term benefits. Due to this volcano that just won't die, Indonesians have been reluctant to settle on the shores nearest to it. Krakatoa is now circled by a halo of national parks, full of ridiculously diverse lowland forest, some of the last in the country. The forests are huge and dense, with relentless vines, sprawling root buttresses, vegetative layer piled upon vegetative layer, and devilish thorns, spines rendering the woods entirely unpassable. The Javan coastal forests harbor an outstanding diversity of primates, including some highly social gibbons. They also have their fair share of beasts, including the extremely endangered Javan rhinoceros, of which there are only dozens left. It is difficult to see, but this is where a rhino plowed its way through the understory and out of my sight just as I rounded a corner in the trail. Sumatra, too, has its monsters. Here is a fresh footprint from a Sumatran elephant, also near extinction. Here is a well-established sample of its dung. And finally, we found the elephant itself. When this photo was taken, we were away from our dinghy on the river shore for only about 10 minutes. When we returned to it, we found fresh Sumatran tiger tracks all around, scent scratches in the duff, and remarkably fresh prints. But Indonesia has its share of cold-blooded monsters too, as I learned on Krakatoa's shores. The archipelago is home to 511 species of reptile, including man-eating crocodiles, but the most infamous reptile of all is the Komodo dragon. The Komodo islands are extremely dry, almost desert, a stark change from the rainforests in the western islands. To get to Komodo, I first had to fly to the nearby island of Flores, then take a series of ferries. Flores is known for its extensive cave systems, as well as for the discovery of the Flores Man, or Hobbit Man, an anthropological conundrum. Here is our approach to the island of Komodo. Even though Wallace sailed right through this exact same channel, he never knew of the Komodo dragon's existence. The Komodo dragon was unknown to science until the First World War. When we came ashore, a troop of monkeys greeted us from the mangroves. This is the safest place for them against the dragons. Walking inland to the visitor's center of the national park, we saw on display the skull collections of the dragon's victims. The rangers toss fish bones and food scraps out the windows of their living quarters, and Komodo dragons take advantage of the snacks, as well as the shade the structures provide. These buildings are all on stilts as a safety measure. It's thought that the dragons are typically unable to climb stairs, but I learned that just weeks before our visit, one dragon had indeed learned how to climb, and attacked a ranger in his bed. There was still blood splattered on the window. Komodo dragons are the largest lizards on Earth. They can grow over 10 feet long and weigh more than me. They can grow to over 50 years old. Like Jurassic Park's T-Rex, their vision is based on movement, but it has a fantastic sense of smell. It can smell rotting flesh from over six miles away. The dragons have a very slow metabolism. Large ones need only 12 large meals a year. That's one a month. During one of these meals, it can eat 80% of its body weight. It's a slow process. One intrepid scientist noted that it takes a Komodo dragon an average of 17 minutes to swallow a goat. These are true monsters. At a sprint, a dragon can outrun a human. It can swim with ease. They can use their strong tails to stand upright or to break the legs of pigs and deer, making for an easy meal. When they are juveniles, they hunt in the trees, dropping down on unsuspecting prey, including humans. Adult Komodo dragons are nomadic wanderers, ambushing deer and buffalo on the fly. They frequently attack humans. Tourists have never been injured, but locals, especially children, are attacked consistently. They also dig up human corpses, so cemeteries on Komodo Island have particularly deep graves covered with mounds of stone. Their poop is white because they can't digest the calcium from all the bones they eat. The way that Komodo dragons, as a group, hunt for prey is fascinating and creepy. I call it the Walking Dead Food Network. You see, Komodo dragons are constantly slobbering. Their spit contains 57 different toxic strains of bacteria. How the dragons remain unharmed by these bacteria is unknown. But this toxic spit is its secret weapon. The dragons just go around biting things, anything and everything. Their saliva infects the bite wound and eventually their prey dies. So they lurk, ambush, bite, and wait. 
And again, lurk, ambush, bite, then wait. It can take a water buffalo up to two weeks to succumb to the toxins. So, as the dragons are walking around biting things, infected victims are staggering around and eventually dying. Dragons then sniff out these rotting animals and have a meal, regardless of whether it is their kill or not. It's a sinister co-op, a devilish potluck. Yes, Indonesia is a land of monsters. It's almost cartoonish, even the flowers are monstrous. Rafflesia is a genus of parasitic flowering plant. They are endoparasites, vines. They spread their absorptive organ, the haustorium, throughout the vine's interior. The only visible part of the Rafflesia is its massive flower, five petals over a meter wide and over 22 pounds in weight. The national flower of Indonesia, the largest flower in the world. Look how big one of its sepals is. It is the largest and also the stinkiest. It's known as the corpse flower, or the meat flower. Supposedly, this smell attracts pollinators. The largest of the genus's 28 species is Rafflesia arnoldi. It is also extremely rare. The fact that they grow on only one species of vine, and that this vine requires untouched primary forest to survive, and that it is endemic to the forest patches of western Sumatra, which is where I sought it out, and that Sumatra has one of the highest deforestation rates in the world, and that the flowers only last a few days each year before they wilt, makes this flower very difficult to find. It takes asking around, and it ultimately amounts to a wild goose chase. I was determined to see one. I reserved five different weekends in the monsoon season to go, so that I would be sure to be free if a flower came into bloom. Once I heard through the grapevine that there were some blooming, I took a 27-hour bus ride across Sumatra. It took three days of going from forest patch to forest patch, but finally I arrived at one particular forest edge near a cluster of houses. A little girl walked out and asked me, Mister, anda chari Rafflesia, mister? Mister, are you looking for the Rafflesia, mister? She led me on an hour hike off trail through the forest full of leeches. She took me right to a blooming Rafflesia flower. Its dark color is a signal that it will soon wilt and rot, only adding to its overall funk. <laughs>